Hello, my name is Alexander Tutnov. I would like to talk about Sergei Prokofiev. When one hears the name Sergei Prokofiev, they imagine entirely different things about his life and about his creative output. In my years of performing and teaching, I encountered many misconceptions and many different ways of interpreting and performing his music. Prokofiev is described as a percussive, sarcastic composer. I can see how some of his melodies could qualify as such. They are prickly, short, humorous, or sarcastic, but there is so much lyricism, deep, long, soaring melodies. Constantine Balmont, who lived between the years of 1867 and 1942, composed this poem titled Fleet and Visions, which in my translation reads, I don't have universal answers. My verse is made of fleet and visions. In each vision, I see worlds of iridescent light. Don't judge me, you worldly wise. What am I to you? I am a cloud of fire, just a little cloud. Look, I am floating now. My visions are for dreamers, not for you. Once I borrowed an edition of this Fleet and Visions from Moscow Conservatory, and on the pages I found a homemade lyrics to some of the pieces, and often they were rhymed. I find it very indicative of the Russian approach we like to link poetry and music, and if the poem is lacking, we just come up with our own. Fortunately for us, Sergei Prokofiev kept a diary from about the sixth grade to 1930s. And there's probably over 2,500 pages of his memories, often to the date of performance or completion of certain work. It is a 
wonderful, invaluable source of information. Number 14 and 15 were written in 1917, and even though only the 19th is referenced in Prokofiev's diaries as this direct portrayal of the crowds bursting on the streets, I feel that number 14 and 15, that they're written very close in that time, could be representing the same event. And you can see both historical circumstance and circumstances of Prokofiev's life according to the year of writing. And we can group them. Those are from 1915 and those are from 1917. And that is absolute revelation. He recorded several. Prokofiev himself felt that this was an important cycle in his life. He himself performed them numerous times out of order, in fact, reverse order. But my thinking that he put the slow one at the very first and the slow one at the very last, number one and number 20, to make an arch and to make it a cycle. But this doesn't mean everybody has to play this in its entirety. We know, of course, that each vertical chord will carry the emotional weight, but there's also a fine balance with this endless line in the top, in the melody. How can we add the emotional value to this? Would you say this chord is sad? and this inquisitive, and this hopeful. When you start analyzing this from the emotional standpoint, this depth that Konstantin Balmont describes in his poem, he says that each vision, fleeting vision, will be full of iridescent, rainbow-like play. You will sooner or later discover also a peculiar fact that Prokofiev in the melody 
does not use any black keys. Simple, beautiful melody. Once you evaluate the melody and the harmony, put them together and add the adjective, you build a much more exciting and musically interesting, enticing phrase. We can only speculate, of course, and I may be a little bit biased, but I do believe that even when composers claim that they're not affected by the singing, the folk songs, they may be in denial because it's unavoidable. Early on, we receive those folk songs, and early on, we receive the training that capitalizes the connection between singing and playing. I want to call one's attention to the ending of the number four, the Pew Sostenuto section, because to me, this is where Prokofiev demonstrates yet another signature feature, which I call the clock. And you can hear the clock in Romeo and Juliet, the tenth of ten pieces in the suite will include this music. Talk. Sixth, seventh, eighth piano sonatas all have this clock like theme or feature. I don't believe I have seen a performance remark of ridiculousamente in any of the piano literature that I can think of. The music, of course, speaks for itself. It is up to the performer to interpret it, whether they look for an inspiration in Animal Kingdom and portray a duck, or maybe they like to orchestrate and think of an oboe solo in the light of this imagination exploration, we could mention Prokofiev's most famous work, Peter and the Wolf. And this piece could very well be part of that. It's humorous, it's quirky, it's very fun.
Number 15 has a very interesting performance remark, in coito, which could be translated as restless, as agitated. Interesting that Prokofiev was particular to this term as he uses it again at the beginning of the first moment of his seventh sonata, which again portrays traumatic, uh, dangerous events. I find it fascinating how descriptive these terms could be and how they can trigger one's imagination in working on any piece of music, especially fleet and visions. Lento irrealmente, which is meant to encourage performers to break away from reality, to dissolve into the abyss. The German musicologist Hans Mersmann once used the term fall upward. I think it's very fitting for this particular piece. What an amazing way to finish the cycle, dissolving 